so I guess our, our best thing to start with is just a quick introduction of yourselves. Just um, uh, I'll sort of mention, hey, all you AES people, uh, thanks for coming in. And non-AES people have been invited as well. So uh, it's great to see so many people. We had so many um, people register, which is excellent. And uh, we got lots of people coming in. That's great. So uh, I'm very happy to have... Um, some guys from Universal here. <laughs> I put up a big uh, picture of uh, the Hitchcock Theater, and I was like, "You want to see what? How, you know, want to know what happens in this room?" <laughs> um, but anyway, so uh, John and Brian uh, do work at Universal Studios, um, and uh, Brian's an old friend of mine, and uh, we have worked together and done geeky things together for many years. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, so today's uh, subject is just uh, all on things about post-production, and I'm sure we'll touch on Atmos because that's kind of a new thing uh, that people are interested in that's uh, sort of uh, definitely has reached critical mass now. Uh, but again, anything else you want to know uh, out there in the world of the attendees there uh, from um, you know, the technical things or just the, you know, the, the creative aspects or just the workflow or whatever, if you want to, you know, talk about, um, you know, effects cutting, I'm sure we can talk about that. Anything that kind of has to do with post-production, uh, you know, obviously we're, uh, mainly from a mixed point of view here, but, uh, certainly, uh, we all have done and know, you know, what happens elsewhere. Um, I was actually, actually just on a, a few months ago on a pretty cool, um, <clears throat> did a, a production sound mixing gig, which is kind of crazy because, you know, usually I'm on the mix side of things. I don't, I don't do as many of those, but uh, it was really fun to kind of be out there and running into the problems that I usually scream at the guys about and going like, oh crap, now it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so uh, let's start and uh, let's, uh, let's have you guys uh, just kind of give a quick introduction of yourselves and then uh, maybe I'll ask a question or two and then um, as uh, our attendees uh, want to know certain things um, or you know we'll expand upon ideas and we'll kind of just take the conversation wherever it takes us. Um, so John you want to start? Sure thanks Jay. Uh, I am John Cook and uh, mostly a post-production mixer at this point. Um, started in music in school many many years ago and tried making it as a composer realized i didn't quite have the chops that you need to to pull that off so i ended up in in post-production which is an amazing plan b <laughs> for a lot of for a lot of musicians in la and around the country around the world um been mixing for about 35 years um been at Tadeo for about 15 years now brian and i've been working together maybe eight or nine years it's about eight excellent and i started my career in post-production doing a lot of comedies um started out with a show called the larry sanders show um got lucky on that and uh ended up sticking with comedies for a while i did scrubs we got we got an Emmy for the musical episode of Scrubs years ago. Uh, went on to the office in Parks and Rec. and uh, But in the last seven years or so, I've been really trying to, to do more dramas. We did Mr. Robot for four years, uh, four or five years. Uh, the Deadwood movie. Um, we got some cool dramas coming up. Um, I've still got my hands in comedy a little bit. Um, but uh you know for 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 the comedies that 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 are fun and interesting um I'll, I'll probably continue to keep my hand in comedies but uh so i'm in a good place where i'm i'm moving back and forth from from dramas and comedies with brian and i'll let you take it from there brian hello everybody uh my name is brian dinkins um graduate from berkeley college of music like Jay and a few others, I think, over here. Uh, went out to LA, uh, started working there, started at Tadio in Burbank, then did trailers with uh, Martel Sound, then had a dabble with um, ADR supervising, tried that side of it, then ended up over at Disney for a while. And it was at Disney where um, Dolby introduced Atmos. And uh, I can go into the wonderful story about that later. 
But uh, then after that, uh, was lucky enough to work with John Cook over at Universal. <laughs> I still remember the breakfast we had when I first met you guys, and and it's been a it's been a great great ride. It really has. Uh, coolest person to work with, seriously. Excellent. And he's been super supportive. Yeah, just now, kind of working my way over to the effects chair, um, thanks to him. And uh, yeah, that's a quick synopsis. Um, Cool. So um, again, you know, we're going to have uh, a lot of uh, experience levels here. You know, there's some people that, uh, you know, have done a lot of posts um, and there's some people here who are just, you know, our students. There's some people here who might be really experienced music people, but but don't know all that much about posts. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll sort of, uh, I, you know, we'll probably go some basic stuff, but also as in depth as, as you want to go. Um, but uh, one thing I just kind of want to um, do a quick overview of, of sort of the, the, um, of the workflow and, and sort of hear your thoughts on that. I mean, there's uh, one of the things I, I noticed uh, when, when I was teaching um, was, you know, the typical sort of um, post-production class is kind of, I, I used to make fun of it and call it the, you know, they basically are teaching you how to do Fox's scariest police chases. <laughs> you know, it's like one man in a Pro Tools in a small room doing, you know, basic stuff. And like, that's not how big, you know, network TV and, and movies are made. Um, you know, it, it, like the, I, I remember, you know, maybe we'll, <laughs> if somebody wants to know about Peck Direct Panels on. <laughs> Like when I first learned about that, so PEC direct panels are, you know, these little film levers, you know, they say, oh, it's the film post-production panel uh, where you can kind of go between playback and direct and then go into record on all the different stems. Um, and that's kind of where I'm coming from right now is talking about those stems. What are our main stems? We've got, uh, you know, dialogue, dialogue is king. Uh, and then you've got all the effects, uh, which, uh, you know, back in the day, there used to be some separate Foley stuff too, but it's kind of all mixed in now. And then you've got the music. Um, so talk a little bit about those, you know, um, and again, there's also things on, on, you know, on big films, there's still going to be, you know, multi-person, uh, you know, mixed crews, uh, you know, on a sitcom thing, a lot of times you're doing most of that yourself, you know, some, sometimes, you know, there's two people, sometimes there's only one, uh, the days of four mixers at a console, I think have long since passed. <laughs> But so talk a little bit about that, that sort of multi-operator versus single operator and, and dealing with the different uh, stems and things. Want to take sure. That yeah, sure. Um, in LA, we are, we're kind of two man uh, crews at this point, um, as opposed to what seems to be the general, um, the general way of doing things in New York um, with one man mixes. Um, <laughs> it's funny though because i think the the budgets seem to be similar so somehow in la we'll get two man crews for a three day mix and barely get through the show and in new york they'll get one man crew for three day mix and they'll get through fine so i don't know what what in the world new york's doing so well but uh they got something going on um uh basically brian i'll talk about the dialogue side in terms of how i'm how things come to me and how i'm splitting them out um, basically things from uh in post-production for those of you who don't know everything's supplied by the sound supervisor who who kind of oversees the whole project for building all the editorial um and he come he or she comes to the stage and delivers um, cut dialogue for me, which is assembled audio from the production tracks um, that a dialogue editor has gone through, smoothed all the edits. Um, so as you cut from angle to angle on different characters, uh, you might have different ambiences. Um, the sound effects, the sound dialogue editor will go in and make sure that you have handles on all that stuff so you can go smoothly from camera to camera, that kind of thing. Um, so I have dialogue. I have music coming in, which comes in in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes it's just a mixed stereo track um, that I'm blending in with all of my elements. And sometimes, hopefully, they'll split it out to stereo stems where I'll get 
um, I'll have split out uh, percussion and strings and uh, guitars and different elements. So um, as I raise and lower the the musical content, I have the ability um, to like raise the bass um, as the volume of the cue goes down and I'm not locked into that mix of a stereo mix um, that uh, that I would otherwise be locked into if I was just dealing with a stereo mix. Um, there's source music where, you know, uh, if you have music playing in a bar, I get that stuff delivered to me. Um, and the other stuff that I have going on is uh, something called Loop Group. And for those of you who don't know, um, when the background actors are in a scene talking away like in a hospital scene you see all the doctors in the background they're not saying anything because you don't want their dialogue getting into the production mic and uh and uh ruining the production mic the production uh sound um so they're they're all just making up stories and and uh moving their mouths basically and loop group is when a group of actors come in look at what the extras are doing on the screen making up a story and basically recording it. And sometimes it's it's five people. Sometimes on big features, it's as many as, you know, 20 people in a um, recording studio kind of walking around the mic. Sometimes they'll have multiple mic setups. So those are the basic things that I have. Dialogue, music, and, and loop group. Uh, real quick, the other thing I have is ADR, which is... Uh, when they go, when a principal actor needs to add a line or replace a line, um, they will record it in a studio, and that'll come up on, on my console as well, and I'll need to match that in with production audio. Whew. That's everything I do. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, that gives you the basic sort of layout, uh, the dialogue mixing chair. Um, a couple of things that you said that uh, definitely... Um, one of the things that comes that 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 definitely comes to mind is uh, if you ever are out there trying to record some ADR uh, in that studio, um, in that ADR studio, um, and you have a music background, you might want to reach for you know the biggest fanciest vocal type mic and get right up on it, uh, and that is the worst possible thing that you could ever do for ADR. Uh, think about the most important thing is matching that into that production audio track. So the production audio is the, the, the audio that was recorded on set during the production. Um, and typically you're going to have something, you know, you know uh, either they're going to, you know, have a plant mic or more likely this boom mic that with a, a guy holding it up on a pole, you know, above the, the actor, uh, this big shotgun mic uh, on a boom pole. Um, and so if you go into the ADR studio, use something similar. You know, use maybe, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, shotgun mic and kind of get it a little bit back from the actor because the worst thing is, I mean, nothing stands out like a sore thumb more than trying to fit an ADR line into production that was recorded like on a U87, six inches away from your mouth. Uh, so, um, uh, Brian, yeah, so you it, wanna... I was just going to add to that, Jay, that uh, some of the, to the other tools that we need to use to match, um, production dialogue with that clean uh recorded adr is there's a lot of saturation plugins that we're using now um stuff that's common in the music world you know things like saturn um mm -hmm. that fab filter plugin or decapitator from sound toys um there's a lot of like proximity stuff i'm trying to do because obviously when you're on the set the boom mic is usually about four four to six feet away from the actor so it's really if it, if it hasn't been recorded at that distance in the recording studio i'm having to to try to push the distance away a lot and a lot of that is like um putting small small room reverbs before uh, before those other plugins right i always thought like you know in a perfect world wouldn't it be fun if you could get your um 
production sound mixer to like take a little impulse response of the <laughs> of the space and then you can use an impulse reverb yes in my in my head of dreams that would be so much fun anyway not gonna that, happen that has actually been some people try discussing that and oh yeah it's really come of it yeah so i mean for geeks like us we'd like it but you know it's pro probably not gonna have much luck getting that <laughs> Oh my gosh. So Brian, you want to talk a little bit about, since you're uh, doing some effects these days, talk about some of the, um, what should we do? Should we talk about, you know, PFX and hard effects and- Since I'm doing a little effects, I'll talk a little about it. <laughs> give, us some, give us some stuff. Uh, just like John um, and the dialogue, and yes, in, in LA, th there was a time with features when you would have three man crews. And a lot of times you would have a music guy just back in the day. He also handled Foley when he wasn't mixing music, he would handle Foley. Uh, but now that guy's gone. So now Foley is on the effects guy. Uh, and I actually, just to let you know, so, uh, I do keep my hard effects, hard cut effects, uh, sound effects separate from Foley. And I do that mostly to help the guys out who are doing the m &Es for our shows. And for those who don't know what m and is, music yeah. and elements for foreign distribution. Uh, I also separate out a wallet that has discernible English in it because you can't have uh, English mm -hmm. when you're trying to do something in Spanish, Greek, Japanese, or, or whatever. So for the most part, I keep basically four stems, uh, effects, backgrounds, Foley, and English. And that gets a little more complicated when you do step into like 7.1 and when you do step into Atmos, you have to kind of make the, some decisions on what you're going to do with that. But uh, just like John, there's a sound supervisor who will basically go to the show runners and they will do a spot session where they sit there and watch the entire show down and make notes. And then he goes to his effects editors and also choose Foley for the people who are going to walk Foley. And they build up that part of the show, which then comes to me. So that's the overall grandiose thing for comedies. Basically, my job is to stay out of John's way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, because they want to hear their jokes. Um, yeah. And actually, that's a good point. Somebody had asked early on, uh, you know, what is the difference between doing, you know, drama and comedy besides about a DB and a half? <laughs> um, what are some of those differences um, in the way it's approached, uh, both technical and, and sort of uh, creative? I think that uh, the big difference is what's happening on Brian's side. I mean, the stuff that I'm uh, there's usually there's usually less tracks on the dialogue side. Um, like the loop group will will tend to be in comedies will tend to be maybe eight tracks wide. Um, but on a big show like Deadwood or Mr. Robot, um, sometimes we'll go out as many as 24 tracks, a loop group. Mm. Um, so there's just more to deal with with a uh, loop group. Um, but in regards to dialogue and the, the way that I mix dialogue, pretty similar. Um, the amount of ADR pretty similar if anything the comedies sometimes have more adr um and music uh same things that i was saying before where the music um whether it's a drama or a comedy will come as a mixed bag some some music editors and composers are really good about delivering stems on every single cue and some of it come come to me in stereo but in the big difference i think is on brian's side in terms of how big the you know there's no there's there's fewer explosions in comedies there's fewer uh you know battles there's you know that kind of thing if you want to talk about it brian yeah uh to be honest i haven't done really that many dramas but uh i have worked with mixers who have and i've been their mix tech and set up a lot of that stuff and one major difference is um, for instance, the comedies I do, I might have 24 or at most like 30. And the, one of the reasons is, is we don't have a lot of time. So you, you can't just dump a 
ton of stuff there and expect to plow through it all and, and be done with the budget. But for something like, you know, Mr. Robot, I remember those were split up in the food groups where you would actually have sections of like, you know, monos and stereos for all cars or, you know, guns or all computers or this type of keyboard. And so you would actually have time to kind of go through and work through a bunch of that stuff. The other thing too, not to just on sound supervisors, but a lot of times it's kind of a little more prepared, you know, and you're not working so hard through the technical aspect of it all where, you know, you're getting to sit back and say, okay, we have more time now because you're not doing it in a day to say, okay, what can I do with this sound to actually help tell their story and get the emotional ideal across that they're trying to do? You know? Yeah. Other, we should other, say, we should say, Brian, that the, the the time difference is really the big thing as well to accommodate the extra stuff so um we are pretty commonly getting three days for a 45 minute show um but we're pushing for more um i've got something lined up from netflix in the fall that's going to be a six day mix mr robot was five day mixes maybe six day mixes our comedies you know brian's doing a show now that is a 22 23 minute show that he has to get through in one day that used to be really be the standard um but now as we move away from broadcast a little bit and into streaming more um we are very happily looking at uh budgets for half hour comedies which are like 28 minutes of material we're looking at budgets more like two days now mm -hmm. um, as more of a common thing, which is just amazing. If I can interrupt, the good place that we did, that was a two day mix, right? That was. No, that was just one. I could have sworn that was more. <laughs> <laughs> so um, is this now, again, I, you know, I, I've been out of Hollywood for a long time now. So um, back, back in the day, comedies, always seemed to be a couple of db louder does that kind of happen is, is the dialogue i mean obviously you still have to be within your your technical range but is that uh are, are they kind of you know evening out now or do comedy still be a little bit louder than dramas i think either of you either brian, of you brian or i think that it's um well brian you you're you're in the back, you have been in the back measuring the LKFS. Um, I think that it, it comes to more down to crews. And I think that generally speaking, I feel like dialogue is brighter with comedies. Um, mm -hmm. We have, generally speaking, we have, um, for those of you guys who don't know, we have LKFS deliveries uh, requirements, which is where the dialogue basically has to sit um, with a, a small range for dy dynamics, basically. And the um, delivery specs for comedies and dramas are the same, basically. Um, Let's you, say that uh, it's it's one difference between the comedies and dramas that you have almost a, almost a continuous stream of talking, you know? Right. Whereas like dramas would be talk, 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 and then be like, okay, now I'm gonna put in an emotional look. <laughs> then you go back to your conversation. So, yeah, and they are bright. They, they can be bright. In fact, um, the show we're working on, it comes across very bright, too. But, but I, you know, going back to the individual mixers, too, you have, I mean, definitely over the course of my career, I have been shaving some of the top off of dialogue for at least mm -hmm. seven or eight years now. But when I started... You know that stuff didn't bother me that much so it would be like super piercing in the upper frequencies you know like 8k just biting your head off and now i'm much more sensitive right. you know as i've gotten more experience so i think that has a lot to do with it too is warming up you know whether a whether a, a mixer tends to warm up the dialogue or not um a couple of things that are showing up here um our attendee from Malaysia wanted to know, when you mentioned a few days to do mixing, is it only for mixing or did you have to do all the sound effects for the ADR as well mixed in? It says. Uh, that's mixing. So everything's cut coming to us. 
and that's how many days we would spend like mixing. So keep in mind, I mean, just dialogue in telling a story is king. So anything that you're doing effects wise has to be in support of that. You're, it's not a story about how a bus drives across the scene, you know, it's, unless you know, maybe it is, but usually I have to kind of wait until, I will go through in our pre-dub everything, but then I have to go back and listen to what the dialogue mix has been. And I work up against that to support that. So, you know, there's this little back and forth, back and forth between the two of us. And to do it, you know, it takes a couple of days or whatever the budget is. It, it actually, if the budget is not that big and they only have a day, well, then we go through the best we can. Some things get missed, some things don't get dealt with. And that's what ends up being the case. And uh, just to add to that, um, the, the, the entire sound schedule um, to actually record the Foley to do the dialogue editorial, to do the effects and design editorial, all that stuff, it varies. Um, sometimes in TV on dramas, it's as little as like 10 days before the mix. They'll have, and, and, and it's multiple person crews. So you, you, there's usually six or eight people getting that editorial work done. Um, but on the bigger stuff, bigger tv shows uh, as much as three weeks to prep and and on the features sometimes six months to prep all that stuff it does seem like that was a lot of time back then <laughs> <laughs> um so there definitely are some questions about you know what are you using for software and stuff and uh, my, my one question is does anybody use hardware gear here i'm going to move aside brian what what are the red things in the middle of the rack there focus right no by the parametric EQs. These things. <laughs> LaFonts. Oh, you, those are LaFonts? Those are LaFonts. Oh, sweet. All right. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the cinema filter set uh, based on the old uh, Yuri Little Dippers 565s. But anyway, so what, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the, the gear, the software stuff, um, what's the main stuff, and is there any, is, is there any hardware left anywhere? Question, weren't those supposed to be black? The uh, Little Dippers were black, uh, the Yuri's were black, but the LaFonts uh, made- They were always red, okay. Never and mind. they added a fourth, they added an extra band. Wow, okay. Yeah, uh, and there's John? a big thing. <laughs> How did cool. you take this? It's funny, I actually had those, those are the ones that uh, when I was teaching at um, uh, New, New England Institute of Art, uh, that, that was in my, they were in my studio there. And when they closed that room, I was like, can I have those? And they're like, nobody else knows what they are, sure. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, I Sweet. think I paid like 150 bucks for the pair of them or something. They were just like, I don't know what those are. Yeah, here, great. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So back to that. So talk about some gear and some software. Well, when I, you know, certainly with music, you know, I'm very much, it looks like the same as you, Jay. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a, I've got a hybrid music studio. So I very much think in the music world that there still is a place for running things through transformers right. um i think that plugins are amazing and they've come come up a long way in post-production you don't have the same kind of time that you have with music you know with with some of my music mixes i don't know what you're doing jay but sometimes i'll spend two days on a on a four minute song yeah. Um, as opposed to two days on a, you know, 30 minute show. So because of time and because of the fact that everything needs to be a hundred percent recallable all the time, um, we are pretty much entirely in the box. A lot of the things that we used to have to go out outside the console for like the Yuri notch filters and, um, a big thing for us was, was noise reduction. So the cedar, the cedars um which were back in the day they're actually they still make a plug-in version which i i still have in my chain and i use but those were the primary way you could reduce noise on a pro on production audio basically now you have amazing isotope tools um remember I'm sure cat 43 <laughs> i was just gonna say i was like john did you ever use the cat 43 <laughs> i never i yeah i always hated the way it sounded man it's so awful. I, it's I was terrible. more like just dipping and diving around yeah. around the air you know yeah. um 
but for those of you who don't know, we're all Pro Tools based in post production. Um, we are f on the dialogue side, Brian, you can talk about your stuff, but on the dialogue side, um, my compressors are for the most part Fab Filter Pro Q3s. Um, I have DSing, I like the Fab Filter DSers. I like, I, I'm still old school, I like the Massey DSers. Um, a Cedar has a great plugin um, still where I'm riding some um, sort of uh, EQ graphic EQ kind of based noise reduction where I can pick certain frequencies to uh, to attenuate. Sometimes that helps when you get really noisy scenes. Isotope is I'm running through I'm not doing anything through Isotope in real time, but I'm declicking, I'm dialogue isolating, I'm dialogue matching, I'm everything in their toolbox I'm using pretty much constantly as I work my way through. I'm using um, reverbs are amazing in the box now between Altaverbs and um, the Phoenix and uh, a host of other reverbs. Um, but that's kind of the overview of sort of in the box tools that, that I'm using on my side. And as far as the effect side, uh, I've kind of fallen in love with the Pro Q3, uh, especially for uh, Foley because you can actually make a band be a dynamic like compressor, which has been great because a lot of times I will get Foley that I have to figure out why this happens, but it will be kind of, it's not a technical term, it's honky, like around the upper mid range above 580 or something. And sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. And the great thing about the dynamic one is that when it's there, it will sit on it. And if it's not really peaking, it won't attenuate it as much. So you actually get to kind of smooth that out. Um, I have cooked that almost on everything. And uh, <laughs> McKeever just jumped in and said, honky, he loves my technical term. <laughs> 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 I will find a frequency for you, Brian. Uh, the uh, compressor, yeah, I have a compressor on everything, but for the most part, it's bypass. And I usually just have a soft knee. I will use a compressor for uh, my Walla because what I'll do is I'll just kind of set it here so it doesn't peek out and I can just kind of put it in a box and I can move the faders. Okay, there it is. And it's not intruding and it just kind of fills the holes where needed. Um, we also use, what well, I do, um, I have peak limiters, um, Nugent peak limiters on all my stem outputs. And that's just to help keep us in spec. Again, uh, television is requiring us to follow an LKFS, which is a volume unit loudness measurement uh, algorithm. And depending on what network you're going with, there's a few little flavors of this guy, but for the most part, a lot of them, except for Fox, uh, want you to be no peaks over two. So I try to print my stems that way, but we also have one on the six track to kind of catch it as well before you know it lays back for broadcast. Uh, I have yet to walk away from the ultra verbs. I really should, because they seem to make the system crash more than I want them to, but they mm. sound really good. Um, yeah, that's about it. So console or big mouse? <laughs> I like the S6. I've been really happy with that. I don't get to play with that anymore. That's uh, John, that's in John sandbox now. And huh. It's uh, what you tell me. I think one of the great things about it is that you can take faders from different computers and make out your own layout and you don't have to have like, okay, I'm looking at this machine or this machine and, and it's great for that. Um, I will say that uh, in working with a lot of music guys, uh, people, men and women, um, post product mixing on the S6 on, in post production is very much you're writing automation from the moment you start your day. Um, with music, you're doing a lot of building up the mix um, before you start writing automation, you know, getting your basic levels down, getting your, your EQ settings. Um, you know, I would say from my experience, I don't know about you, Jay, but eighty percent of the mix you're you're doing in suspend basically or preview. Mm -hmm. um, in post production, you start writing from the 
from the moment you get started in, in the day. Um, I Dialogue mixers have a tendency to write to the end of the project, so I'm grabbing faders on the console. It's really kind of, um, it's really essential to have a tool like the S6 in, in post-production, um, as opposed to music where I'm still, you know, mixing with, I'm mixing with an S3, but I could, I could be mixing with a mouse if, if I had to. Right. Um, I find it takes more time because uh, the room I'm in is not an S6. It's a, uh, I forget, I'm a complete blanking on the console. Anyway, it doesn't have as many knobs. So I'm constantly having to grab a mouse, which takes time. Whereas if before I was like, there's a button, go, here's Vader. And you know, you can't grab two parameters at the same time with a mouse where on the console, you can do that, you know? So definitely a lot of questions, and this is predictable uh, about, you know, how do you network? How do you find job opportunities? How do you work your way up? What do you do? How do I get a gig, man? You want to start, John? <laughs> sure. I think uh, I just I just hit a button. You guys can hear me? Yep. Okay, go. Um, I hit a button. Uh oh. <laughs> um. It's really hard. I'm not going to answer this one either. I'm thinking, yeah. how did, I, how did like, this happen? Wish there's, I a, knew. There's, a, there's a couple of basic concepts that I always tell people, and that is the rewards come from commitment, I think. And with whatever you're doing, whether it's in audio or, or something else, I, I truly believe it takes 10 years. I think sometimes 15, sometimes 20 before you start to feel like you've re you're really entrenched in your network. Um, and the consistency of reaching out to people um, is more important than anything. I think people are busy. Um, I have people, I, I constantly tell people that if I don't get back to you, don't worry about texting me again or emailing me again. I don't mind. I'm just, I get so busy that I can't, I can't return phone calls all the time or, or return emails. Um, but if I see your name over the, you know, over the months or, you know, realistically over the years, um, you develop relationships that way just by being around and sticking it out um and the other thing that i would say is continually improve your craft do whatever you have to do at home or on the job whatever it takes watching youtube videos trying out new things in your home studio going to a friend's studio to to ask him how he does it immerse yourself a hundred percent in this crazy world that we're in um because th there's so much to know that you're you're just you're never going to stop learning so as long as you keep a hundred percent commitment to that learning process you're going to you're going to do fine because you're going to become once you get your 10,000 hours in you're you're going to start to become an expert you know yeah Brian I'm still working 10,000 hours <laughs> I always feel like I'm working on the 10,000 hours um me I started out well I mean Berkeley College of Music kind of has their fingers in the pie out here a little bit but it, not really with a lot of the majors. It was a lot of the mom and pop shops. And that's where I started. So, uh, but like John says, you need to keep open relations because this whole business is not, it's not being solo. It's a collaboration with other people and being able to work with other people uh, is important. Um, I think for me, it was like, like John said, building up the skills. And the other thing is actually knowing somebody. So if you have like, you know, your skill set built up and then you 
there is a job that's a possibility for you to work and somebody who's there that you know that you've worked with is there, you, you have a better chance of getting it because you have the skills so you don't get fired. And then you have somebody there who can kind of vouch for you and say, hey, this guy's okay. Uh, before I worked with John, I think, think it was Mark Fleming that you chatted with about me or oh, maybe it was um, maybe it was Larry, I, I forget. But I knew a lot of those people and I had already done the gig and I knew what I needed to do with that. Um, and then of course, being available when that position starts up. Um, but yeah, like John says, it's just keep working at it and keep in introducing yourself to other people because you never know and I'm going to cut this off because this is going to go into a long diatribe about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you meet one person and you're like, oh, that person can't get me where I'm going, but they might know someone you want to know. You know, this is how you start your kind of network. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. My sort of a couple of bits on that are, you know, first of all, it's kind of like what John said. It, it really is kind of a war of attrition. Um, who can stick at it longer? You know, a lot of people are like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be so much fun. And after a couple of years, they're like, mm, I'm not doing what I want to be. Forget about it. So are you going to be the person that sticks with it? And and just um, people will see you there year after year and you're getting better and better and you're reliable. And uh, I mean, that's that's part, part of it really is the war of attrition. I mean, if you if you just wait it out long enough and keep working at it and spend those hours getting good and meeting the people, so that, that's part of it is don't expect too much too soon. Um, the other part is a lot of these gigs that you're looking for aren't gonna show up like on monster.com, <laughs> you know? They're not gonna show up places uh, like that. Um, sometimes, you know, they're word of mouth or at the best, you know, you're gonna do is find them on, you know, I don't know, like a CAS web board or something, some audio society people, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of kept in. So, I mean, that means um, join some of these organizations. And if you don't have the credentials to be sort of a regular member, then be a student member or just meet the people and talk to them. And uh, once they sort of uh, have developed a relationship with you, even if you're not on that sort of in that circle, they're going to say, Oh, you know what, I heard this uh, stage is needing a recordist and you know what, you know, let me put you two together. So uh, a lot of these uh, gigs come from not, you know, you're not gonna just find them by accident. You're gonna find them through your network. I think I got your recordist gig, didn't I? Um, we should, as a matter of fact, yeah. And I wasn't even kind of looking for it at the moment, uh, but you're just like, hey, uh, by the way, I'm moving on. Yeah, it's like, I'm moving on to Alias. You want to do uh, <laughs> you want to do Angel? I'm like, yes, I would. Thank you. <laughs> and oh, that's, that's it. Awesome. So now, like literally, like- I forgot yeah, about that. That, that <laughs> thing didn't, that, that, that job never got posted anywhere. It didn't, it didn't exist. Um, like, I think you actually, before you, before you even told them you were moving on to Alias, you were like, I want to have somebody lined up for them, you know, uh, and, and literally that's, I mean, gigs happen that way. So like, Brian's a friend, I, I, I wasn't even like shaking the tree at that time. And that just shows up because of the network. So, and it was great. It was fun, you know? That's awesome. And that's, that's just like Brian to, to set everyone up before he departs to make sure everyone's happy. Yeah. He's like, uh, you know, I don't want anybody. I don't want any downtime. I don't want problems. I don't just, we're going to make this perfect. <laughs> so yeah, it was great. Um, I care about the people I work with. <laughs> I know. I say, you know, wow, what a concept. <laughs> um, what uh oh somebody i just want to mention this thing uh yeah people talking about you know building your organization your professional network uh it definitely and in, in post it's not just um you know it's not the same things as as in music you know and obviously aes is common to everything uh but like in music you know you want to do some narrow things but in post you know you want to do um you know uh Sound Editors Guild, or you want to do uh, Cinema Audio Society for Mixers, you know, you know, you want to connect with with those groups as well. Um, we should definitely talk a little bit about the technical uh, Atmos. stuff as well. And yeah, we should definitely mention the Atmos, because uh, that is for sure a different way of working these days. Um, and how pervasive is it getting? I mean, is it is it showing up everywhere now? I mean, uh, you know, are, are people starting to 
We're, yeah, it is. A lot of showing up on all the TV shows. shows and... Oh, so yeah. TV shows are doing it to try to future-proof their right. shows. Yeah, Netflix and Apple both require it now. I don't know if they are... If you can get your hands on it, though. Or, that, I don't know. If you can listen to a Netflix show. Right. Um, oh, yeah, I don't know if they're streaming. But we're delivering those you know, for Apple and Netflix consistently now. And I think that's, um, yeah. One interesting side note is, is that the RMU, which to this day, I still don't really have a meaning for that acronym, is so close to DMU. And I guess they just change it to RMU. Yeah. Renderer. Uh, but because it is a renderer, you can take, uh, thank you, Brian. Render, master, and unit. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's got my back. I love him. Brian, yeah, Brian uh, McHugh is uh, another another buddy of ours, a uh, Berkeley guy. So we, we are always talking to each other. It's like you did what? You do it like that now? Uh, but one of the interesting things about the RMU is is that it will do a lot of fold downs for you. Like if you have deliverables or you need like if you do an Atmos mix, you need a seven one, and you have the Atmos file, you can now make a 7.1 from the Atmos. You can make a 5.1 from the Atmos. You can make an LTR2 from the Atmos. You can make an ROL or, or from the Atmos. And I've been talking to our guys at Universal who are in the back room who work in mastery and saying like, y'all should be hip to this because it's going to take work away from you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we should talk a little bit about Atmos. You know, what, what are the differences uh, in Atmos versus a regular surround situation? uh from the you know the bed plus the virtual channels uh and the fact that it's it's sort of the whole point of it is that it's scalable to to different uh speaker outputs but without me getting into that so brian talk a little bit about you're you're sort of the you know, you're the most geeky guy i know right so <laughs> uh my first experience with it was with disney we did the movie planes and unfortunately, at that time, on the stage was the only time anyone was ever going to hear it in Atmos, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because none of the uh, movie theaters at the time were going to buy into it because there was another system called the Barco right. system that was out there. And they were tired of spending money to find that they were holding the short end of the straw. So they just sat on it. And so that movie never really got a chance to be delayed. That way. But there was a lot of growing pains in that thing. So first off, it's a device that allows you to create beds and objects. You have 128 inputs into the thing. A bed is sort of like a, a stem configuration, but not really. And you can think of a bed as like just the atmosphere, like I'll just use a background for the most part. It's just like, this is where you would put like your surround mix. And then you would have objects that you can move things within side of that. Now the RMU would be set up that you would take that bed and those objects, and then you would fold it down to a stem per se, is what you would do. Um, and at the time it was mostly for theaters. I thought this was like, you know, the 1950s widescreen fight all over again, because in 1950 TV came out and people were like, why do I want to go to the movie when I can watch this, you know, on TV? It was the same aspect ratio. So then movies came out with the widescreen like CinemaScope to make it a new experience. Well, now we have home theaters, you know, what can you do there? And I thought they were gonna just now have Atmos so you can up the experience level again. And it is really cool. It's really cool what you can do with this where you can literally move something around. The RMU, the device itself is privy only to the room that it's attached to because they came in and they spec'd it out. They have all the speakers there They know what the size is. And that information is stored in the RMU. So when you pan, it figures that out as where to put it in the speakers. So if you go to another room that has an RMU renderer that is now knows the footprint of that room, it will do the same thing. There should be little to no um, deviation from one room to the other for the most part. Yeah, that was that's a lot of information. Atmos's Sorry. Thing is that it... <laughs> Yeah, the whole point of Atmos is that it's not like, oh, it's a 7.1 mix. You have eight channels and that's all you ever have and you need an eight channel thing. There are a bunch of different Atmos configurations. Uh, and for that matter, like you said, you know, uh, down mixes uh, to, to a regular surround. 
Uh, and so the theater or another, uh, you know, stage or a home room or whatever, uh, each has its own configuration and Atmos will take that sort of um, that virtual uh, spatial information and, and create, send it to the appropriate speakers for your particular room. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the plan. That's the plan. All. I had um, for like to to kind of go with you know John's setup. Um, the first bed is this music, which is a nine one a nine one configuration, mm -hmm. which is crazy when you think about that. <laughs> and then he has a bunch of objects where he can you know move parts of music and stuff. And uh, are you moving? You're moving your music off the screen, aren't you, John? Yeah, I'm using the front wall speakers for the fairly consistently. Um, but it's it's pretty static. My uh, my panning for music, um, as opposed to some of the guys that I've learned from in features, where they're moving things around a lot. Um, I haven't had the time to really move things around too much, and the static position just takes it off the screen a little bit. Um, creates a little bit more transparency. I mean, from a creative side, the thing about Atmos that's that's pretty brilliant is it creates a kind of transparency that 5.1 doesn't have where you can load up all of these elements and the fact that everything kind of has its own space, you get this clarity um, and this lack of muddiness that's really, really fun to to work in. What else can we say about Atmos? I mean, what about um, so let's let's talk a little, uh, just a little bit nitty gritty about it. So what? Um, so you're uh, the people are moving like the like individual musical elements around a lot and not just kind of using them as a bed. I mean, we can all understand why you would like you know be throwing effects all over the place. Uh, but other things are also uh, being turned into to objects and and being sent around. And what is the actual sort of physical process of what do you do? You know, how do you do that? What's what's in the, the software? How do you turn decide what's uh, in the bed, what's in an object, and fly it around? That is a hard question. I know, but that's what people <laughs> know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, even even the guys that I've um, gotten great advice from who've been doing it for five or six years now. Um, I don't know. I, Brian, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if they're flying things around with objects. I think that they're. it's what they're doing within beds for, for music. I think it's the the specific um, uh, sound effect, hard effects, helicopter buys, right. plane buys, those kind of things where you want to pinpoint, but... Uh, you have you to know, be careful with that because you don't want to take them. I mean, the screen is still here. Yeah. And if you take them out, you know, that could be just as detrimental, you know, to what John is saying. What we used to call the exit sign effect makes you watch, you know, as you get off the screen, you see What's the exit that? sign in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do think that one thing that's pretty common is to to bloom into the into the rest of the room, into the back speakers and into the ceiling speakers. So mm -hmm. you have um certainly with with sound effects it would be easier to explain but with with music, you know, whether it's a big percussion hit or something, um that effect is basically just moving the panners within my nine one basically uh, bed within my bed to achieve that um, when we did Deadwood we got into a little bit of trouble it was only the second thing that I had done because we you know when you when you first start mixing in Atmos it's like it's like candy you want you want to you want to try you like because it's there you want to try to use it and right. try to do do something with it and our first playback we quickly found out um that we had to pull things back into the front screen a little bit more not not do as much panning so that would be a word of warning for people doing their, their first atmos mixes yep i remember um, on um planes at disney 
the thing that did work, I mean, if you had like, we have an aircraft that would fly out away and that would take it. But a lot of times you have something that starts back here and brings you to it, you know, that mm -hmm. wasn't so disruptive because you're like, your attention is now back to the screen. Right. But um, yeah, I still think it's amazing what, how music sounds in it, you know, and, and what John has got going on, I think is great with it. It's amazing. Yeah. The, the, uh, um, and, and working with, in the recording process as well, it's fun. So the, the Carter Bur Burwell score that we did on Space Force for Netflix last spring, um, they knew we were going to be mi mixing in Atmos. So they, at, uh, at Blackbird in Nashville, I think it's the name of the studio, they, they did some ceiling mics that uh, the music editor, when he came into the room, he specifically asked for those to be placed. And in TV Atmos, you've got six discrete speakers up top. So um, I think between what they gave me and distributing it with reverbs, we kind of made a lot of that discrete up in the ceiling too. And I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever going to hear it. Um, you know, maybe when when people can. St I mean, I guess when people get their Sonos Atmos bars or. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know other commercial. I know that there's three or four commercial uh, Atmos bars out there now, right? I think so. Oh. I think Sonos is uh, one of them as well. I will say, though, okay. effects-wise, it's great to actually have the speakers on the side because usually in five one, you have something back there. It doesn't really go like this. It's like here and poof, it's up there. And now you can literally track it, you know, right. which is kind of cool. Um, somebody's asking, how big does the room need to be to set up at most correctly our room is but pretty small comparatively to other atmos rooms um i think that what do we have brian we've got like 20 foot ceilings and it's like a thousand square feet i think is our room it is and, and it's pretty well specked out with the speakers because i mean we got the three the three above <laughs> there's a lot of the speakers back. in our room a lot yeah. of speakers, speakers and, uh, uh i think typically you i you know I don't know. I, I was going to say, tip, typically, you see these uh, these rooms that are more like 2,000 square feet, but they they set up a um, a really small room. What are, what is what is E, Brian? Is that like 600 square feet, 500 square it's feet? It's small. It's small. And they Even when they set that up for for atmos and they did uh what did frankie just do a remix on uh oh i'm sorry i, I forget the movie that he just did remixed in atmos in a 500 square foot room so I remember disney had like small rooms like that too and it was weird because you would have certain speakers and then you have speakers on the floor that would then bounce the sound up to the ceiling to mimic the ceiling sound right. uh and they got that to work so and I, was... and I don't know much about what sound designers uh in atmos what kind of rooms they have but those are like 300 square foot rooms um i don't know how much mixing they're doing um but they're certainly building sounds in atmos and doing pre-dubs uh in a in a pretty small room like that that's a very good point, John, because uh, editorial for delivery for Atmos is very different from a 5.1. And that happened when we started on planes. We had to literally stop down. We had some huge meeting where we were going to make a decision. Are we going to do this in 5.1 or are we going to do it in Atmos? Because editorial had had enough. And they're like, we need to know which way we're going to go. Because they were going to build it for Atmos or they were not. And if they were, they were asking for it another week edition just to, just to do that. So yeah, you, you kind of you have to know right off the bat that you're going to go Atmos, and then you have to kind of look at the show and say, what's the show kind of about? To decide how are you going to divvy up your beds, how many objects do you need with each bed? Um, so then you know, so one show will be one way, another could be a little different. In fact, I think one of the, I guess I could say the Apple show we did was very different from Space Force because so we reconnoitered that. I remember that. Yeah, little little America for Apple was our first 
attempt that was uh, experimental. Uh, so Tell anybody. You, <laughs> do you ever d deliver binaural format? Do you ever do any B format stuff? Yeah, I wouldn't think um, so. I mean, that's, that's for a different situation. But I mean... Not, the Atmos does have a binaural output on it, but yeah, so, I don't see anybody using that. Yeah, but it's it's entirely possible. Uh, I mean, the, the once you have something in Atmos in the same way that it can be, um, you know, a, a, you can play it in, in, you know, a room with just two overhead, four overhead, six overhead, whatever, it, it, it will sort of map it to that. Uh, you could also make, if anybody needs a B format, you could certainly make one from, from Atmos once it's, once it's there. I had to guess, um, I would say the binaural output is probably for like editors who don't have an Atmos room, don't have the speakers. Mm -hmm. But you can get the software that will mimic it. So you don't have to have an RMU per se. And yeah. you can say, okay, this is kind of what it's going to do if you wanted to place, you know, this here, here, and here. But uh, I haven't heard of anybody who's actually been using it, to be honest. Yeah. And then also, uh, so, yep. go, go ahead, Jay. I was going to say, it also brings us to somebody saying, can I use Pro Tools or other DAWs to deliver a mix for Atmos, or do I need proprietary hardware software? And the answer is, of course, a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. <laughs> Um, do you want to tackle that one? I mean, I know so, so Pro Tools has some some basic Atmos tools in it if you're just creating thing, but not exactly uh, a final rendering. But so, if you're going to do a mix, I would say you need to be in an Atmos room, which would have an RMU. Yep. You would need a, a digital audio workstation that supports the Dolby plugin and also can communicate to it, because this all of this is over uh, an Ethernet switch. So in Pro Tools, there's where you actually choose the RMU and you start up a communication between that so it can actually talk to the computer, also get the pan automation that way. So like Jay says, it is a little bit of both. I mean, if the, the workstation that you have can handle that and you can get yourself in a room with an RMU. Yep. I would and say there is there. a basic, like Pro Tools has an option and I forget the details of it for like a basic renderer but not a final renderer not one that you could like deliver with but one that you could sort of use i think that's the plugin that you're talking about exactly that you can use again if you're a content creator and you want to just sort of be able to test it out and go am i close but yeah that final your your final delivery needs to be done through that army and uh, but I, yeah, to make sure i'm not fucking a turn i have never seen that plugin or used it so i can't really comment on it hey i haven't used it either i just know it exists yeah uh, so I can't say how good it is either. Um, and this also, when you were talking about sort of, you know, the ethernet and all that stuff, somebody had asked a question about like how much of being an audio engineer now is turning into being an IT professional. I mean, geez, uh, on the live side, of course, with Dante and ABB and things. And of course this, I mean, yeah, yeah, there's, 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 uh, there's a little IT involved in making our craft work. John and I also, what do you um, think? John and I also benefit from the fact that we have a really, really great engineering crew in the back wings that takes care of a lot of that stuff. They build it all out and, and make that happen for us. So as far as coming in on the creative side, being mixtures, you really shouldn't be thinking about that. It should just work, <laughs> which is, doesn't always happen. But um, yeah, that, that's usually some of the engineers and, and those guys put that together. But to get the room set up, somebody's got to do it, yeah. But, you know, most of us started out, I mean, I, I think the most successful um, people in the re, in the re-recording chair that they've they've sort of started from the ground up. And I think that whole world has changed, obviously, the, in the in the back room. So I mean, to know, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I skipped it, so I don't know how to turn on my firewall or conf <laughs> configure my network and all that stuff that I think it's pretty important I think if you're going to start from the ground up try to get a recorder's position and work your way up in the industry you know I would strongly still suggest doing a recorder's position because you get to be in a room where you're hearing something being mixed properly in a properly sounding room and you get your ears used to that you know and then you, if you're working with a crew, that's great. You know, not everyone can work with an amazing person like John, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
you get to learn some cool stuff from them, things you never thought about. And I've always been a person who likes to ask questions. And I always like to ask women, why did we do it this way? Why are you doing it that way? Never come at it as like, what the hell is this all about? You know? Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. to, to quote, um, uh, Brian's going to beat me up on this. I just blanked on his name from NASA. Steely-eyed missile, man. Uh, it's good to know a little bit about everything. For sure. Um, somebody had asked uh, er earlier in the thing, uh, what were some of the techniques you used to make dialogue king? When we were saying dialogue's king, so uh, how do you make sure that it's king? Um, they're asking, um, you know, how do you treat it so that it stays on top of the other elements? Is there EQ or compression or other tips? Um, anyway, that question's from Peru. I think it starts with hitting hitting the target with dialogue with dialogue because and by the target i mean the eq target and the volume target basically and if if you're hitting that consistently you know dynamics in tv are pretty insane it's basically plus or minus 2 db but it's really it feels as as you're working it feels like even less than that you want to be hitting that target all the time and, and that comes at first when you're learning how to do it by looking at meters a little bit but after you're doing it 10 15 20 years you know exactly uh whether you're hitting that mark or not um i would i would recommend for future mixers that they experiment and i think this would kind of go maybe not as much with music but maybe with music as well where you set your monitor level at the same place every day and don't touch it, leave it there, tape it down. And you find that level by sort of playing with it, knowing what you got to hit and then playing with where the sweet spot for how loud you like to work basically. And tape it down and then you know you got to just hit that all the time and in terms of hitting the the eq target you know that's just carving out mids and controlling the low end all that stuff that we're, that mixers do um all that is to say that once you hit that target and that's your foundation everything else can kind of be built up around it um and sort of be judged uh like whether a music cue is not too loud it's usually you know pulling pulling the music back a little bit it's pulling elements back sometimes it's pushing dialogue over certain loud scenes but for the most part it's using dialogue as a foundation i think that answered it yeah so two things that come up there is just uh yeah the the importance of a reference level especially in post um but it's definitely worthwhile in uh in music applications as well uh, obviously you need to be you know as a music mix you need to be changing things up a little bit more as a mastering engineer you're in a smaller range and then you get to post and reference level is everything uh not only just because there are specs to uh, hit um, but also you know this is going to be played in some places it's not just going to be you know played in a home where somebody can turn it up or down uh you know if, if it's if you're doing you know features and it's theatrical um you know you don't have any control over people turning it up or down in the theater and so the reference level is extremely important uh you need to have a room that's at that reference so that when you know if the dialogue sounds too loud well it's going to be too loud where the people are hearing it if you can't hear it well they're not going to hear it there and you can rely on your ear and what you're hearing to be the same way that someone else will experience it so reference level is so important uh and yeah. then the other thing you had mentioned that somebody had asked was about meters yeah that and so yeah you uh, want to talk I, about I, ref I, reference level for a second but then also then tell us what meters you're using yeah i was going to say someone asked about spl level too that was and brian that, oh <laughs> Brian, Brian's your friend. Brian's my friend. Yes. <laughs> so, TV is usually seventy nine ish. We change um, it to actually hit our LKFS, don't we? 
We do when we're off a little bit. Sometimes we're off. Rarely. <laughs> we try to be on. That is never um, off, Brian. Never. 79, 80, usually 79. Uh, features are 85. Um, and then metering, you want to talk about, Brian? There's a question of metering, I'm sorry. Just uh, what meters do you use? What are you looking at? What do they need to do? Uh, we're using full scale. So you know, I think we zero... should have you know, one. What? I was going to say, uh, I mean, I would assume, you know, uh, something that's going to be showing peak and average in some way. Back There's, in the day, um... you know, we were using Duro and Logitech. Uh, John and uh, mostly I see uh, dialogue guys will be on the meters probably more than I will because mm -hmm. I'm referencing everything I do around their dialogue and they're trying to hit a certain mark and we usually use like full scale meters to kind of show where minus 24 is because um, I think someone is asking what is the target for LKFS it's actually depends on the studio but for NBC it's minus 24 plus or minus two. Minus 24 is called full scale. So zero means zero attenuation. And then you have attenuation all the way down to infinity. And we're like down at minus 24. The problem with this is that you can't really use a meter all the time because the LKFS is a measurement of the average over time. So you could have something really, really loud as long as you have something really, really soft. And then the average of that works out to be 24. You're good. But if you keep it 24 throughout the entire thing, you're probably gonna be minus 24 as well. So John is actually, uh, we're using actually a software, which is just a meter software. And we actually set it up to where, you know, okay, now we're in the red and he sees that and he knows that's the level he wants to be at. But a lot of times uh, we'll work on a show where I will measure the first act after we've done it, just to see where we are. And if we're above or below it, and we might make adjustments after the fact to try and hit this LKFS and this is where we kind of come in and sometimes change where the level of the room is. If we're too hot, then we're going to bring the room up and we're going to bring our, wait a minute, we'll go the other direction. If it's too hot, we'll bring everything down and then bring the room back up so that we're still doing that. So I hope that answers their question. Yeah, and I was gonna say, uh, I saw another question there that says, uh, is it harder to hit your LKFS when there's not that much dialogue? It is really hard. We did an episode of uh, Mr. Robot last year and there was no dialogue, the, uh, or, or very little. The, the whole show started with Rami Malek saying, Rami, Rami Malek's character saying, I don't feel like talking. And the rest of the, the episode was without dialogue until I think the last 30 seconds and then there was another line of dog and, I remember and, and we couldn't hit L L lkfs so we called we were working with usa on that and we called usa to ask to to make an exception for us since there was no dialogue and they were kind enough to do so we changed it from the measurement was their normal measurement is a dash dash uh, one with dialogue getting and the one that we ended up using was a dash two slash three, which is usually what music and music videos and uh, commercials would use. Mm. And the difference between the one is the dash one. It was funny. Me and the engineers actually took several of the stems that John had worked on and we just asked the meters, okay, how much dialogue do you see in this? And it was less than 10%. And we ended up talking to engineers and they end up saying, okay, what would you say is a loud show? And we ended up choosing the two dash, I mean, two dash three. And Amazon was cool about that. So we ended up doing the show that way. But an interesting thing that people might not know about the dash one is that the gate only comes on and starts measuring when it senses dialogue. It doesn't just measure dialogue. If there's music and effects around that dialogue, that gets measured as well. So if they're talk, 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 and they stop talking, you stop measuring. So now you can have really loud effects and music doesn't matter. Hmm. Interesting. I'm gonna make a note of that. Forgot about that episode. That was so much work. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it, there was that technical aspect of it that it sucked that we had to even think about it because it was yeah, such yeah. a creative show, but we did have to think about it. And fortunately they, they compromised with us. Mm. 
sad part was that we had to tell everybody downstream that this particular episode was not going to be measured with the typical Amazon spec or else they would have thrown it back to us as QC and we would have gummed up the works to make it to air. Right. Um, somebody had asked, what's, what's an average day of work like out of, you know, they said out of Disney or someplace like that, or, you know, what do you do when you first come in? And uh, I, it's a farther on the uh, list there they said something about you know uh you know have they, have they listed you know has somebody asked for changes uh do you have a client present what's what's an average you know what's what's the work day like it's uh it's changed a lot with COVID, <laughs> with covid now um actually we could do a whole a whole run on on remote mixing now um mm. before covid uh usually have one producer uh, sitting behind you all day, um, who's usually biting their tongue, not not giving you mix notes as you work, because that's the worst part of what we do. Is as you're grabbing a fader to to lower it, someone's yelling out behind you to lower that line, and you're like, sure, 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 I'll get to that. But really, in the back of your mind, you're like, that's what I was about to do. <laughs> Um, we work with a lot of. Lot I just of pulled up the tracks. What do you mean they're not mixed yet? Exactly. Um, and then you know, depending on whether it's you know what the schedule is for the mix, if it's a three-day mix, we often need to be ready to play back by the morning of the third day. Um, and then the playbacks are usually the executive producers, um, which could be a couple uh or more sometimes in our little thousand square foot room we've had as many as 20 people crammed in there um especially on pilots which are like you know sort of auditions for for shows um and uh the playback days are are you know pretty pretty busy you get people um, we watch the show down and then everyone takes their notes and then the rest of the day we're we're trying to hit hit notes a lot of the notes require sending editorial back uh, to their rooms to 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 redo a certain scene or, or a different effect if there's you know sometimes we we realize there's a missing dialogue line or a loop line that'll get fixed by the editors um and then by the end of the day, you know, we're lucky where, I mean, in TV, which is a lot different than film, we tend not to do a second playback after we get all the fixes in. It's basically, we're fixing the show as we go. They're signing off on the fixes. And then when we get through everybody's notes, that's it. Everybody leaves and we're done. A lot of times goes right to layback. Yeah. Hey, Brian, who, who is our producer on... Um on Angel. I can't uh, remember the name. The associate producer or the producer producer? Um, not the executive, the uh, the actual, the, the not the, not the associate, not the woman, the, the, the guy, the regular. RJ Vesiglio. RJ, exactly. <laughs> RJ maybe pulled that out of my head. Talking about, I can't believe you remember that either, <laughs> but talking about changes, oh my God. Uh, he definitely was the guy that would tell you to change something like as your hand was on the fader, but the funniest thing about him do you remember car doors no matter what you do and we got to the point he had this thing that he would say whenever a car door would 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 uh would close and we would start doing like okay we're gonna i'm gonna make this car door so freaking loud and we're gonna put about like plus 12 db you know like of a low shelf on it like he's get, and he would say still no matter it was just like no matter what a car door do you remember what he always used to say could you thunk oh, wow. that up a little bit <laughs> Could you funk it up a bit? I mean, we were starting to play car doors like they were freaking explosions. And you'd be like, ah, can you thunk up that car door a little bit? <laughs> like, jeez. I do remember that. I remember David just going like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, so what, another question that showed up here was about um, differences in challenges uh, doing animation versus live action, of course. In animation there is no production sound you have to create everything uh but um so um yeah talk about that stuff uh does it modify your approach in atmos mixing um 
besides the fact that the poor bastard editors have to absolutely create every little piece of noise that's going to be heard. Uh, <laughs> from a Nick mix standpoint, does it change anything from your your side? Brian, I don't know if you want to take it because I don't have, I've never done an animation in Atmos. Um, I did a couple animation shows early in my career. Uh, it's been a while. Um, for the most part, it's a, it's less about cleaning things up as it is about, you go straight to balancing and, uh, and it's it's a lot of fun it's less um you feel like less of a of a cleaner on dialogue you know but brian you've got more experience with uh with animation and atmos most of the time with animation uh, like john is saying it's clean and as jay is saying they will they call it shooting where they bring him into the same room or room like adr but you're responsible for making it sound like it's five or six feet away from you or up close. So you basically end up writing down a lot of notes about reverbs that you use for particular parts of the scene. And sometimes you even will do so much as like, you know, put a high pass to, you know, shave off the low end so it doesn't sound like it's so close. So there's that workload, which normally happens naturally in the world when you have a mic. So that's the added level to it. As far as uh, Atmos, you can be as creative as you want or get as you know, crazy as you want with that, but you're still trying to you know, put a story up there and make it sound like, okay, if this was not an animation, it was real, this is what it would be like, unless you're going for some psychedelic, you know, off the wall type thing, in which case, you, know, you do whatever you need to do to satisfy their creative intent. Somebody had asked about um, when you are getting stuff uh, delivered from editors. Actually, oh, this is actually looks like from the video editors. Uh, it's an AAF or a media composer. That's more of, I guess, what gets delivered to the audio editors, not so much to, to the stage. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, what, what sort of comes in? And while we're at it, talking about deliverables, what goes out? What do you have as deliverables? What comes in, what goes out? The... Um... It's interesting that it might be a good time to talk about temp, temp effects, temp, temp treatment. Um, we run the a, a pretty big range of um, um, what picture editors are doing these days inside their avids in terms of cutting sound effects and cutting ADR, cutting you know, t trying to do pretty, pretty extensive temp mix temp mixes of, of TV shows and movies. Um, Mr. <clears throat> Sorry to keep going back to Mr. Robot, but that's a good example because those shows tip, typically got delivered to the editors um, at least 32 tracks wide, sometimes 48 track wide. Um, and like Jay said, uh, those were... I don't know the conversion to Pro Tools. I think they were AAFs to get there. But once those effect, once the sound supervisor has that delivery, he will rebuild uh, the dialogue with a dialogue assembly program. I don't know if you guys know more about these programs. Um, we have a, a dialogue assistant in our department at Universal that does this full time basically and the client delivers a uh an edl and um i think a drive with all the dailies on it so all the audio that was recorded on set and there's these programs that will basically build the entire show straight from the sound dailies and um uh, with the um the handles that you tell them to set so you've got nice big you know 10 second handles on each line of dialogue and then that's what goes to the dialogue editor but um in terms of the sound effects that they build in picture editorial it's pretty amazing at how first of all how much the sound supervisor needs to be involved with the picture editor very early on to make sure that the picture editor is trying to 
to is, is building sounds from a good sound library and if they're just pulling it from a stock library um the tendency of and this goes for music too the tendency of the executive producer to get used to hearing mm-hmm. his show a certain way even if it's built with with not the greatest music or not the greatest um uh, sound effects he's used to it and it's really hard to unring that bell so when the sound supervisor rebuilds the scene with better effects a lot of times we'll go back to the temp track that uh, was originally built by the sound editor just because that's what the executive producer is used to um, is used to working with so in terms of what gets delivered from from picture editorial yeah yeah, that was uh, some of the sound supervisor did, which I thought was brilliant, uh, actually feeding the picture editor effects that they needed so that, you know, they weren't pulling from some esoteric, you know, library and then they would fall in love with it. And I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. And as for delivery, it definitely um, saves. Uh, a- Sorry. And then just keep going on delivery. Yeah, as for delivery, I mean, once uh, this, all the audio once it comes to the stage is wave twenty four bit forty eight k. That's that's what gets delivered to the stage, and what leaves the stage is a twenty four bit wave broadcast forty eight k file. And depending on the, so when a show comes to say like Universal, they have a contract which in that contract has the, what they need delivery wise. They have to fulfill that delivery in order for all their producers and whatnot to get paid. So it's kind of serious to look at it. And then there is like a list of things they need to be delivered either as just an audio thing, which then gets married to a file or it gets laid back to a tape, which is happening less and less nowadays. But for the most part, everything that comes out is at 48K, 24 bit broadcast wave. Um. I think we are just about uh, out of time. We usually do about an hour and a half on these. Uh, do you guys have any other things that uh, you were hoping we would uh, get to talk about that we haven't? <laughs> uh, anything that you guys are like, I can't believe they didn't ask me about the most important thing. <laughs> I see that someone said how to pick the best EQ plugins after having so many EQ plugins. Uh, start with the Pro Q3 and then refine your tastes from there. There's a lot of great products up there. Um, and what I've been told recently in natural phase, uh, that's how the Pro Q3 sounds the best. I concur. Excellent. Well, I guess uh, then uh, we should um, wrap it on up. And I want to thank John and Brian for coming uh, to this and uh, talking with us. And I think we had a a great time. We had a great uh, group of people uh, watching. We got to a lot of uh, good comments. So uh, I think we had a a, a great panel. Um, uh, As always, uh, AES folks, um, we have, uh, we try to be pretty active here in in the Boston, New England chapter, and uh, we've got a couple of uh, cool things coming up. Um, Some that uh, we're not quite announcing yet, but we have a few really cool things in the works. Um, We we have a classical recording one coming up uh, in a little bit. Uh, We might do a little tour, a virtual tour of um, of uh, Symphony Hall, uh, so that'll be kind of neat. Uh, but then uh, the stuff. Going to after... talk about the Deca tree. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. Actually, you know, that's a good idea. I should get uh, Casey Stone. Uh, he's uh, one of the guys that uh, uh, one of the scoring mixers out there. And we did a uh, when I was out there uh, doing. You know, it was kind of weird because I always had one foot in kind of both worlds. And even when I was in the music world, we were doing some. Um, uh, soundtrack mastering so Casey was uh, one of the mixers that would come in uh, scoring mixers and we would do soundtracks with him but um, that would kind of be interesting if uh, we do a panel on like scoring mixers because it's it's this unique like classical techniques plus 
rock and roll techniques plus some other unique weird little things going on it's this really cool uh it's scoring is really really neat but anyway um new idea for a panel jacob write that down <laughs> um but we've got a couple of other ones like i said uh we're we're, uh, we're working on one big hot shot mixer dude that um we went to school with uh and then we're working on a, a nice um uh, we've got a, a few organizations. There's some great organizations around um, about women in audio. And, and as we all know, it, it totally underrepresented in, in our fields. Uh, and so we're going to do uh, uh, something uh, with a few of those organizations uh, about women in audio. So we've got some cool stuff coming up. Keep an eye out. And uh, as always, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you so much to my guests. It was great speaking with you guys. And uh, thanks to uh, um, Zach and Jacob, uh, who... Uh, keep this uh keep the lights on so to speak here in our chapter <laughs> and uh other than that i guess i'm gonna say good night uh and we'll see y'all again soon thanks jay thanks jay you're very welcome thank you night guys <laughs>